Good evening. I'm Jama Raubach, a partner here at Mercy View. And tonight our scripture reading is from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 2, verses 11 through um, 15. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jema. Well, again, welcome to Mercy View. Uh, my name is Brad, one of the pastors here. And um, we're so glad you're here tonight. Welcome to, uh, to a time of worship. If you're, if you're visiting with us tonight, we want to say a special welcome to you. Um, I know Trey welcomed you already, but I just want to echo that and we just pray you're encouraged by your time with us. If we can serve you in any way, we'd be happy uh, to do so. Hey, before we jump into our passage tonight, I want to celebrate something with you. Um, as we do here annually, uh, at the very beginning of December of last year, we invited you to give to a special Christmas offering uh, to go to a couple of very special people to our church uh, to bless them in their ministry in the kingdom. And so um, I'm happy to report to you tonight that uh, because of your generosity, uh, we are able to gift to the Campbells, uh, Jim and Laura in Oldham in the UK, and then the Hoyts in Albuquerque. Um, we are going to be able to give them twenty-seven fifty dollars apiece because you guys gave $5,500 in a special Christmas offering for them. So I want to say this to those of you that gave. Thank you. I am so honored to be a part of a church that desires to give graciously and generously to, to mission, uh, particularly mission that happens outside of the four walls of what we do here. You are to be commended for that. Thank you for giving. If you were those that gave to this special offering in the next few weeks, we'll be sending these gifts to uh, the Campbells and the Hoyts, and I know they will be blessed tremendously by those gifts. Well, one of my favorite authors when I was a kid, honestly, still one of my favorite authors uh, to this day, is a man by the name of Mark Twain. You probably know the name. Um, he grew up in Hannibal, Missouri, which was right up the uh, I-55 from where we used to, to live in Missouri, where I grew up in the Boot Hill. Uh, and actually, where we lived in the Boot Hill was pretty close to the Mississippi River. In fact, I remember in uh, 93, uh, the big flood that, that happened with uh, the Mississippi River in that part of the country. I remember going to a, a church over in Cape Girardeau, which was just across the way, which was right on the river, and vacuuming water that was seeping up through the tiles of that church just as a way to serve them in their, in their basement. But one of my favorite uh, reads as a kid, and actually Owen's reading this right now uh, at our home, but uh, is a, a little book called The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Probably heard of that too. And in that book, if you remember, Tom was worried about what other people might think if he and Huck Finn hung out. And at one point in the book, this is how the dialogue went. Huck says, now Tom, ain't you always being friendly to me? You wouldn't shut me out, would you, Tom? Because see, Huck had heard the, the rumors. And Tom says to Huck, Huck, I wouldn't want to, and I don't want to, but what would people say? Why, they'd say, Tom Sawyer's gang, that's who you're a part of. Pretty low characters in that gang, isn't it? And they would mean you, Huck. And Tom is saying to his friend, Huck, look, 
When it comes down to it, I can't let you be in my gang because people won't approve of it. You will make us look bad. One of the most prominent stories in all of humanity is that you and I are trying to figure out who is in our gang and who isn't. And to answer that question, we believe that we have to make calls on who should be in our gang and who shouldn't. In fact, much heartache and and actually blood has been spilled over trying to figure out that issue in the history of our world and even in our own country and even in our own city. Why do we do this? Why do we have hostility towards those who are different from us? Why do we worry, like Tom, what others will think about what group we're a part of because of someone else that's a part of that group? Why is it important for us to elevate ourselves over and above other people? What would it look like for us to see one another differently? How should we see one another differently? And does God have anything to say about this? Well, each year around this time, the the week of Martin Luther King Jr. Day, we have taken a moment as a church to talk about one of the pressing issues of our day, the issue of racial harmony. And we've done a lot of good work along those lines over the years. I'm really proud of the work that we've done. I pray that we will continue to do that work because there is much work to be done, even in our own city. So one of the things that we have wrestled with annually around this time is what does racial harmony, racial uh, reconciliation have to do with us here at Mercy View, a predominantly white church? And here's what pastor and and, and great uh, preacher Charles Spurgeon once said. He said, Satan always hates Christian fellowship. It is his policy to keep Christians apart. Anything which can divide saints from one another, he delights in. Since union is strength, he does his best to promote separation. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 2 that our enemy, Satan, has designs or a blueprint for disrupting our unity in the church. And for that disruption in our unity here then to spur us on to disunity in society, to get us off mission in culture. Like, let's think about it just for a moment. The very last thing that that the enemy wants to see is a strong and spirit-empowered church that is pushing back darkness in our city beyond. He will do everything to get in the way of that. And one of the primary ways that he does that is by convincing us that it is okay for us to be divided, to be fractured, to be unreconciled. He would love nothing more than for us to spend our time in fighting with one another instead of serving and and loving one another within the church and then serving and loving those outside of the church. And so tonight, at this time of the year again, we want to take another look at this issue from another angle and continue to press into the values of unity and and impartiality and love. We want to get that into our body to continue to ask the Lord this question. What part do you want us to play in the work of racial harmony in our city, in our country, and beyond? And as we do this tonight, I just want to invite you to see one thing, and it's this. The gospel is a truth to believe and a truth that guides. Let me just say that again. The gospel is a truth to believe And a truth that guides. Maybe we could say it this way. The the gospel is truth that you and I are to place our faith in, to believe in, right? It's something that we do with our hearts and our, our, our minds. But the gospel is also a truth that is meant to guide us 
in our lives in all ways. It's, it, it is to affect our attitude. It's to affect our, our behavior, our actions, the way that we live. The gospel is both a truth to believe and a truth that guides. So tonight we want to look at the passage you heard Jamer read in Galatians 2. It's a, a very well-known passage in the ministry of Paul. Because it is a very provocative uh, 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 scene where, where Paul is calling out a fellow brother, another apostle by the name of Peter. And uh, get a sense of, of what this passage has to do with the issue of racial harmony. But before we do that, I, I just want to take a look at the very first half of Galatians 2 briefly just to give us some, some context for where we're headed. In fact, we really need to get this because it, it sets up where we're headed tonight. So in the first half of Galatians chapter 2, we see a very important principle that Paul is laying down about the gospel. And in this part of Galatians 2, the first part, we are looking at, we find a group called the circumcision group. Paul's going to later call it the circumcision party. Now, this group of, of people, many of them religious leaders, believed that Jesus was important. Like they didn't really have a problem with the person of Jesus. But they said that placing your faith and trust in Jesus to cleanse you, to redeem you, wasn't enough. And in their case, they said that in addition to the work of Jesus, you needed to adopt the entire law as well. This would be things like cultural regulations or some of the dietary laws or the ceremonial laws. And, and one of those things included circumcision. They believed that in order to be a real Christian, you had to be circumcised. And this is where the question of the gospel came in to the picture for Paul. If you add anything to Jesus to be cleansed of your sin, to be redeemed of your sin, Paul wanted it to be known that you no longer have the gospel. Like the second that you add anything to Jesus, you have nullified the goodness of the gospel. Or said another way, in Paul's view, it is Jesus plus nothing equals the gospel. And here's what Paul is getting at. He is saying that the difference between believe, obey, then you are saved, which is what the circumcision group believed, is not the same thing as believe, be saved, and then obey, which is what Paul was trying to get across here. It's and really what Paul is saying is it's not really the difference. If you were to put those things side by side, those aren't two different like denominations. All right. He is saying if you put those two thing, things beside one another, you actually have two different religions. In other words, does God save us through the person and work of Jesus alone or is Jesus somehow a part of a package that we bring into our spiritual lives in which we save ourselves? Paul went to Jerusalem to talk with the other apostles to get that cleared up. That's what's happening in the first half of this, this chapter. And in the end, what we find is that there was unity around Paul's understanding of the gospel. That, that Christ alone is enough to cleanse you. To make you acceptable in God's sight. So it is believe, be saved, and then obey. Not believe, obey, and then you are saved. And that brings us to our passage today. Now you would think that the circumcision group would have got the, the, the message here from, from Paul and the apostles. Right? The Paul, Paul and the apostles get together, they agree about the nature of the gospel, but we see here that they didn't get the message. In fact, unfortunately we're going to see... That one of the apostles, another apostle by the name of James, has seemed to influence a group of men to go back to the, the wrong-headed view of the gospel. So let's look there beginning in verse uh, 11 as we look at our passage here tonight. We find that Peter has come to a church in Antioch. By the way, Antioch is a city that was a missionary kind of base for, for many of Paul's uh, missionary journeys. 
Um, he comes to a church. This church in particular was a church that was made up of, of Gentile believers, uh, Greek uh, Christians. All right, so not Jewish, but, but uh, the, the, the way in which the gospel expands the call and, 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 and includes uh, Gentiles. That's the, the, the group of people in this church. It's the, it's the Gentiles that uh, this church that Peter goes to are in. But we also see Paul has now come to that same church. And uh, uh, jump, if you would, to, to verse 12 real quick. Notice that Paul says that before certain men came from James. And so what Paul is saying is that before he showed up, some men from James came to this church. And these men started hanging out with Peter, and Peter started hanging out with these men. Now, most commentators believe that these men were probably sent from the Jerusalem church by the Apostle James. And when they showed up, they began to convince Peter, a Jewish Christian, to separate himself from the Gentile Christians and only hang out with the Jewish Christians, the ones who have been circumcised. Now, this seems odd, right? Here's James, who was one of the apostles who agreed with Paul that the gospel was Jesus plus nothing, right? These, mean, these men who were apparently under the discipleship of James had now shifted back to believe, obey, and then you're saved. How could this have happened? Well, it happens the, the same way that it happens to you and I. The way that we can know the truth about the gospel but slip back into a misunderstanding of the gospel. Jesus plus our good works our obedience, our spiritual activity somehow is what makes us acceptable before God. These men had slipped back into that. James had apparently slipped back into that. And now Peter is as well. And in this particular instance, it had to do with the idea that it was Jesus plus what made you pure before God. So these men came to Peter and they put pressure on him to separate as a way to be more pure and it says that he drew back and separated himself from the Gentile Christians. Now look with me, if you would, back at verse 11. Paul shows up to this scene. And by the way, this is happening in public. This is not like a private deal where Paul said to Peter, hey, let's go have a, a side conversation. This was so serious to Paul that he was willing to talk about this in public. And make this point. He shows up at the scene and says, But when Cephas, which is a name that Jesus had given to Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Now, this doesn't tell us so much about what the gospel is, but it's telling us something about what the gospel creates. Or maybe we could say it this way, it's showing us how the gospel should operate in our lives. In fact, I would argue that this passage is one of the most important passages in the Bible for us to understand how the gospel is meant to work itself out in our lives. In a sense, this passage comes to me, comes to you tonight to say this, yes, you may understand the gospel you may believe the gospel, but is it controlling the way that you live? You see this down in verse 14 when Paul says, When I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, he is saying that Peter, though he knew the truth of the gospel, believed the truth, believed in Jesus, his actions were canceling out the very nature of the gospel. Here's the thing that I want to invite you to see this evening. The gospel is both a truth to believe, right? That Peter believed it, but it is also a truth that should guide us. It creates tracks for us to run on and to know how to live, now, on the ground, Paul is actually saying that this distortion of the gospel that Peter is involved in is, is actually leading him to discriminate against another race. That's where we begin to see the connection of, of what we want to talk about tonight. But before we jump into that truth, 
Let's talk a bit more about the principle that Paul is trying to help Peter see and in turn us see. There's actually a little Greek word in in verse 14 that is unique, not just in the Bible, but in all of Greek literature. It's a word that you'll probably recognize whether you know Greek or not. And it's the word orthopodio. Now, podio is the word that we get the word podiatrist from, right? It means to walk. The word podio means to walk. Now, the word walk is actually a very significant word in the Bible. Both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the word walk simply isn't about us like moving around with our legs, but it refers to the very course of our whole lives, right? You've heard us talk about your walk with Jesus, right? We're not talking about the act of walking with our our legs and our feet. We're talking about the way in which you and I live in relationship with Jesus over the course of our, our lifetime. So, for example, in 1 John, when we're encouraged to walk in the light, what does that mean? Well, it means that we should let the whole course of our lives be controlled by the light. So the word walk includes everything in your life. It includes your thoughts. It includes your feelings. It includes your motivations, your behavior, all all of those things. So one's walk is the whole course or whole direction of your life. So orthopodeo means straight walk. It means to walk in the light straight. So Paul is saying that there is a way that you and I can be out of step with the light that we are to be walking in. Our lives can be spiritually crooked. Or said this way, the gospel, as much as it is a truth to be believed that we place our faith and trust in, it it is also something that sends out all these lines through our lives, and we are to bring every part of our lives in line with those lines. Not living in line with the gospel then is not being affected by the truth of the gospel we claim to believe in. Are you with me? That's the principle. That's how you're supposed to live your life. That's how I'm supposed to live my life spiritually. We are to always be wrestling with the implications of the gospel in our lives and to bring every part of the gospel, our walk, our thinking, our feelings, our actions, our behavior in line with its intended trajectory. So it's interesting what Paul does for us here, right? Essentially what Paul does here is he gives us a case study. Now he could have illustrated this with just about anything, but he chose something to show us how the line of the gospel matters when we are wrestling with who should be a part of our gang. Look there beginning in verse 15. Let me just read that again. Paul says this, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Here's what Paul is saying. Listen, this is important. God did not have fellowship with you, Peter, on the basis of your race and culture. You were not justified, Peter, because of your race and your culture. So how dare you? turn around and only have fellowship with other people on the basis of race and culture. He is saying to Peter, Peter, you have forgotten the gospel. You may know the gospel, Peter. You may even remember the gospel in your relationship with God in some way, but you are not drawing out the implications You're not applying the gospel in this area. You have grace over here, but but you don't have grace over here. Now, here is what Paul could have done for Peter. He could have said, look, Peter, you're breaking the rules. You're actually breaking the racism rule. The law of God says racism is a sin, Peter. Don't do that. But Paul's point here isn't to simply say... 
that racism is a sin. That racial superiority is a sin, though it is. He wants to go further than that. He wants to say that that your racial superiority or your desire to separate yourself from someone of another race or another culture is not living in line with the gospel. He's saying that your racial superiority is you forgetting you've been saved by grace. Now Paul is is not saying that the entirety of the gospel message is somehow about the issue of, of, of racial superiority. Remember, what he's doing here is he's giving a case study to highlight the ways that you and I don't live in light of the gospel. And what Paul is saying to, to Peter here is that one of the implications, Peter, of you not living in light of the gospel is that you somehow think you're better than others. He's saying you're treating people on the basis of their race or their culture And God didn't treat you that way. Really what Paul is doing, and this is so interesting to me, is he's saying that as an example, racial superiority is a form of works righteousness. Let me tell you what I mean. It's a way that some are trying to add to Jesus. It's a way that we are saying, I I have to do something besides just believing in Jesus to cleanse myself and to make myself pure. What is the something else? Well, in this story, it's to feel a sense of superiority over those who are different uh, than than Peter. But it's, it's broader than that. More broadly, it's to feel a sense of superiority over anyone who is different than you in any way. See, the reason that Paul connects racial superiority to the trajectory of the gospel is because if you simply say that something is just a violation of this rule, you're only looking at it externally. You're dealing with a surface sin. You're not asking what the sin is beneath the sin. You're not unveiling its spiritual roots. Many parents here in the room tonight know that one of the things that comes very easily for us is like when our kid needs to be corrected, to just tell them to stop doing it. And here's the the hard truth, that doesn't really work, not in the long run. It's not sustainable. And, And why? Because merely denouncing something or, or, or trying to get somebody to do something to, to modify their behavior, um, it doesn't last because it doesn't go deep enough. It actually works against the very thing that you and I as parents are trying to do with our kids, which is to see their heart change. The same thing is in play here. Paul could have just said to Peter, Peter, stop it, right? Stop doing this. You know this is a sin. But he connects it to the gospel, And he does this because he wants Peter to wrestle with the idea that he is looking to something besides Jesus or in addition to Jesus as a way of making himself right before Jesus. When you do it Paul's way, it actually leads to real change. Because without the knowledge of the roots of sin in our lives, we really can't do anything meaningful about it. Like you and I can spend a lifetime of repenting of surface sins, but it's a treadmill, friends. Paul is saying that the only real way to be transformed by the gospel, to make deep spiritual change in our lives, is not just to berate ourselves and say, do better. I'm breaking the rules. This isn't good. God is going to get me. Be better. Do better. No, what you have to do is what Paul is doing for Peter here. You have to see exactly where you're turning away from Jesus. You have to admit the places that you're looking to something else to make yourselves right before God. Why does anyone feel racially superior? Why does anyone have any problem that they have? They are living out of line with the truth of the gospel. 
Yes, they're committing a sin. They're breaking a rule, so to speak. But when it comes down to it, they are adding something to Jesus. They're adding something to the gospel. You've heard me say this in a a variety of ways. And uh, some of this comes from a a pastor who I I really appreciate by the name of Tim Keller. But he says that the gospel, it's not just the ABCs of Christianity. It's the A to Z. The gospel is not the first layer in a pile of Christian truth. And then you and I are to move on to deeper doctrinal things. I love doctrine. I love the deep things of God and theology. But the gospel is actually the hub of all the wheel of Christian truth. In other words, the gospel is the way that you and I deal with every problem that we have. Its intent is, is for it to help us with every challenge, every obstacle, every barrier that you have in your Christian life. Like the, the way that you make progress in any way in your Christian walk is you finally get the gospel into the area you've not gotten it before. And at every point in our Christian lives, we should never stay, say, I got it. I understand the gospel. Got it, Brad. I'm a Christian, you know, what's the advanced stuff, Brad? Like, what do I need to move on to? This is the advanced stuff. The gospel is the advanced stuff. You never get beyond it. You never can get beyond it. The reason for every bit of your problems has to do with the fact that you don't believe that. In fact, one way we could say it is it is this way. The reason behind all of my problems in sanctification in my my walk is that I don't really believe my justification. Not like I should. Sanctification in many ways is the process of you becoming more and more holy and good, but not because you were trying to make yourself right before God, but because of what God has done for you through the personal work of Jesus, you're becoming more and more free. Justification means, right, it's a big theological word, but it just means this, you are completely accepted because of who Jesus is and what he has done. By the way, if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus and you're hearing this this message of the gospel tonight, the good news of the gospel for you is what I just said. You can be completely accepted Because of who Jesus is and what he has done. You may not believe that. You've walked in here tonight thinking that there's no way that Jesus could accept me. He knows what I've done. He's seen my past. He's seen the ways that I have failed him. There is no way that I could be accepted because of who Jesus is. And friends, that is actually the truth of the scriptures. You can be completely accepted and forgiven. If you place your faith and trust in Jesus, it's a free gift. And all you have to do is receive it. It can be yours tonight. Friends, the reason behind all of our problems is that we aren't living out of our justification. Or you're not living through it. The great reformer Martin Luther, when commenting on Galatians 2.14, provocatively said it this way. The truth of the gospel is the principal article of all Christian doctrine. Most necessary is that we know this article well, teach it to others, and here it is, beat it into our heads continually. Paul wants to push back against our Racial superiority in this uh, passage today, but more broadly than that, he wants us to stop adding anything to the gospel. For you, it may be that. It may be racial superiority. We would all do well tonight to ask our hearts that question of whether or not we look down upon anyone of another race or culture. If so, if that's you tonight, you should repent of that tonight. But you can fill in the blank with whatever it is. Look at anything in your life that you would recognize as sin that you just can't seem to find victory over. You can't seem to, 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 to come clean on. You're, you're having a hard time uh, responding to the truth of the gospel about that issue. 
you will always find that as you begin to dig down to the root of your sin, the real problem is that Jesus is not enough for you. So like when we sang earlier in, in the song, the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul, and we have this on our lips, we say that what Jesus did for us is that he paid for my sin, not in part, but the whole. What we're saying is that we believe that what Jesus did was enough for us. And what that begins to do when we believe that, the gospel starts sending out these lines in our life. And so what I want to encourage you to do is to look for them. See them and see the areas in your life that aren't in line yet and come to know the freedom that comes when you get the pauls of your life to come alongside you and challenge you or you challenge yourself to get those areas in your life right. And Paul is giving us this radical principle that will free us up if we'll let it. Can you imagine what would happen in this church if the light bulb went off in all of our heads on this? Like, this would be a, a beautiful place of real accountability, real honesty, real freedom, real unity. Like, I want to be a part of that. Do you? If so, we've got to let Paul confront us tonight. And see how living in line with and in light of the gospel brings a freedom that you and I only dream of most of the time. But friend, Jesus offers it to you, to me, to us tonight in his gospel. Will you receive it? Let's pray together.